Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's right. Thank yeah. you. Hey, hi, everyone. A lot of uh, familiar faces. Uh, thanks all for coming. I'm Carlos Costa from IBM Research. I'm the tech lead of Foundation Model Platforms at Research. Work very close with uh, Red Hat, our friends, and I uh, have my co-speaker here, Tanim. Hi, everyone. Thank you all for coming. I'm Tanim Ibrahim. I am an engineering leader at OpenShift. I particularly focus on OpenShift AI inferencing workload, as well as trustworthy AI and model registry solutions. Very good. So thank you, Tanim. Uh, let's take you through our effort to build an end-to-end -end platform for foundation models. Um, we don't have our third speaker here, Nick Hill, he couldn't make it. Um, so our effort is all about how we can simplify, again, the end-to-end -end life cycle of foundation models from data preprocessing, training, fine-tuning, and serving, right? Um, I want to kind of highlight some of the emerging challenges, right? We've been talking about this during the summit, uh, but I want to kind of use this to really anchor what are like the new things that you're seeing? Why foundation model is different from a platform perspective, right? And how we can build a fully integrated open source stack for this, right? Um, we're seeing this inflection point, right? There is no doubt about this. So what is really changed is like the economy of bringing AI to the enterprise, right? We all know that for a long time, doing AI in the enterprise would mean that you go to a use case, you do all the hard work of finding the data, labeling the data, right? Picking a model or an architecture for a model, training this model, validating, and finally deploying. deploying. Uh, in practice, this will take like uh, at least a year, right? And this for one use case. You need to basically go through this, the same process, right, for a second use case, a third use case, right? Very costly, very, very prohibitive. I'm sorry. Uh, what happens here is that uh, this is the reason why we haven't seen adoption of AI in the enterprise living up to the uh, expectation that you all had, right? It was very cost, costly. What changed here is that we, with the foundational models, now you can start with a pre-trained model, right? It's much less investment, or well, some investment up front. You can start with something that's pre can uh, and then you can fine tune this model. You heard this many times. What happens now is that you can apply the same model to different use cases, right? Fine tuning this model is much less costly, right? You can use much less labeling, uh, data labeling, right? And then now you can go to more uh, models. That's why the enterprise cares so much about foundational models these days, right? So if you go to the next step, the next slide, thanks, Tani. Uh, this is again, I mean, it's a workflow, meaning that you have to go through these steps and the. Uh, the difference is that these steps are very much heterogeneous, right? When you talk about data preprocessing, for example, uh, uh, for data preprocessing, many times you just need, like, say, CPUs, right? It's kind of a scale out, uh, very simple filtering type of computation, right? When it comes to training, uh, this is way more like hard specific. You need the network and so on, right? And of course, when you go to like all the way to inference, you're talking about uh, throughput, right? Latency. Uh, inference closer to the data, right? We all know this, but the point here is that how you put together a platform that can cover the whole spectrum of these workflows, right? What are these standards? How we can simplify the life of the user as I go through this uh, workflow? Um, when you talk about the challenges, uh, we talk a lot about the scale, and of course, training uh, is hard when you go to billions of parameters. Uh, the problem is also is on the integration, right? If you look at this environment, it's very fragmented. One of the key pain points, and you keep hearing this across most of the talks in the summit, is the fact now that you have to combine uh, different uh, tools, right? And how we put them together is one of the biggest challenges, right? So what I would do for now is basically take you through our point of view, how we're putting this together, of course, Leverage Array, but also all the open source uh, tools that we're also contributing, uh, and how we all bring this together in enterprise ready application and some of the use cases as well. Tani? Thank you, Carlos. So, one key theme in all the talks at this summit so far has been around collaborating in open source, various open source upstream communities for LLM, training, fine tuning, prompt tuning, inferencing. Um, all the primary workloads, they're all built around open source. That's where we're at Ray Summit. So, so AI is clearly driven by open source. It's the new model of innovation. Everything from PyTorch to, code, uh, to Ray uh, to TensorFlow, they're all advancing at lightning speed due to the power of open source and the collaborative nature across various communities. 
Uh, so Red Hat has always been historically been a trusted advisor in open source, and we are doing the same. We're helping guide our customers through this ever-changing AI landscape. Uh, and this is why we established Open Data Hub uh, community. So Open Data Hub is a project that allow that brings best of breed high uh, AI ML tools from labeling through partner ecosystem, uh, through uh, open um, PyTorch, uh, various notebooks uh, uh, support in various inference technology through KServe and Model Mesh. All of that comes towards in one open uh, one community where you can easily deploy that platform. And, and, and enable organizations to run the AI workload. Um, so if you look at historically what Red Hat has done with various other open source projects, so from Fedora to Enterprise Linux or from Kubernetes to OpenShift, we are doing the same with Open Data Hub. And we're taking Open Data Hub learnings from it and we are building OpenShift AI. Now, um, how can we actually apply the same open source first mindset to building a foundation model work, uh, workload for the enterprise, right? So with Open Data Hub, we have open source based frameworks for training, fine and fine tuning and prompt tuning, and also serving foundation models. These projects, all of them reside in their own upstream communities. And then we take them and we use the Open Data Hub operator orchestrator to provide an end-to-end -end deployment stack for your customers to easily prescriptively deploy a stack for training, tuning models, inferencing with models, trustworthy AI, having a model registry uh, integrated, and also be able to do metrics, um, mo modeling, monitoring, everything that an enterprise grade uh, foundational model workload would require. Um, and, and then once the incubation is done in this midstream Open Data Hub community, we take them to OpenShift AI as an enterprise offering. Um, so let's dive for, uh, let's dive a little bit more into the actual training and validation stack. Uh, so uh, for on the left hand side of this diagram, you'll see the stack that represents how an Open Data Hub and OpenShift AI um, a user would run their training and fine tuning and prompt tuning workload. So Codeflare at the top that provides data scientists and ML engineers a very simple Pythonic way of um, start spawning up any large training cluster. So let's say you have a Ray job and you have to run a Ray train job. You can literally do that from your laptop with the Codeflare SDK and submit jobs that will spawn up large scale Ray clusters depending on the type of uh, number of GPUs you need, number of nodes you need across, uh, across, across your uh, AWS cloud or other cloud providers. Um, also, under the hood with Codeflare, we have um, MCAT, which stands for Multi-Cluster App Dispatcher. That is essentially a batch scheduler that works with the actual underlying provider, be it's on-prem or in the cloud, to instantiate all those um, jobs it could be a PyTorch job, could be a Ray job, could be a Spark job. As long as the job type is defined, it goes and instantiates that for you. And not only that it instantiates the cluster for you, it also um, looks at when your workload is no longer needed, it actually shrinks down the cluster. So you save on your GPU cost, you save on your overall AWS quota or any other cloud provider quota cost. Now, you need something that will actually guarantee that you can go and scale, right? So how would, how would MCAD know that you need your AWS cluster uh, and you actually have the coda to be able to spawn that and make that large cluster? And that's where InstaScale comes into play. So InstaScale works with um, your native coda management system and knows that, okay, how much coda do you have in this provider for you to how much scaling up you can do with number of GPUs, number of nodes, number of, let's say, EC2 um, instances with AWS or OpenShift in nodes underneath the hood. So, and it also allows you to do priority queuing. So let's say you have jobs that are higher priority and you have multiple tenants within your cluster. They all are fighting for the same GPU workload to do their training jobs or tuning jobs. It will actually can assign a priority to those jobs and it will actually go and share the resources uh, in a fair, fair and fair way. Now, um, moving on to the inference side of the stack. So everything for the LNM ops journey for our users starts with KServe at the, at the top. So KServe is our controller. Uh, we work with the KServe community very closely. That actually uh, takes all the different stack that we have with uh, KKit, Compositional AI Kit, and Text Generation Inference Service. And I'm gonna dive a little bit deeper into uh, those two stack. So 
Um, Kkit uh, essentially uh, is, is, a, is an abstraction layer, which is a Python-based API so that a data scientist or an app developer doesn't necessarily need to know about the intricate details behind Kubernetes CRDs or how, how do you work with the Kube API. It essentially abstracts all of that out into a, a simple set of APIs that allows an app developer to take a model and apply different operations to a model. So it could be get a model that's deployed in the cluster today, or you could uh, register that model. You could do run prompt tuning jobs with that model, but you don't necessarily have to know all the details behind how to do that, because a lot of app developers are not machine learning engineers. They may not know all this workflow, right? So that's where we have developed Kkit uh, to provide that orchestration behind the scene. And not only that, it also uh, kind of organizes different model formats into one single formatted API. So your model could be a foundation model with PyTorch, but it could also be a sklearn model, for example, for a classification uh, type of use case. It will, it will, the API do not change based on your model type. It provides the same abstraction layer for you. Um, uh, another important part of this component stack is the TGIS, so which stands for uh, Text Generation um, Inference Service. So Text Generation Inference Service is a, a very early fork of Hugging Face text generation inference project. So those of you who have uh, worked in LLM serving space probably have heard of TGI. So we forked uh, um, uh, Hugging Face 1. Dot some version of it from the community into uh, TGIS, Text Generation Inference Service. And the primary reason um, we did that was uh, essentially around adding a lot of enhancements for the inferencing site. So one of the en enhancements we added working with the Hugging Face community is around continuous batching um, so that multiple different type of workloads, inference workloads, which are similar in nature, could be batched and could be run and scheduled on GPU very efficiently since you know, the fighting for GPU continues. It's hard to get GPU, so it makes it very efficient. We also looked at um, options like um, but we also work with Meta um, and, uh, and the PyTorch community to uh, contribute to the PyTorch 2.0 compilation of those models, which have provided amazing speed ups uh, for models that are like Llama 2 or 70 billion plus level parameter models. And, um, and then we also uh, work with the TensorFlow community to, uh, uh, for the uh, tensor parallel nature so that we can do sharding for the large, uh, large language models uh, across multiple GPU, which essentially allows you to have uh, reduced latency around it. Um, going to hand it back over to right. Carlos. Thanks, Tani. Oh, and build Thank on you. top of all these great open source innovations that we're building, uh, we have uh, launched the Watson X platform. Uh, this is one of the most important offerings IBM has right now. This is, a, of course, a response to all like the demand and challenge that we see in the industry to go after foundation models. As you can see, again, it goes across all the like life cycle that I mentioned before. It has three components. WatsonX.ai, which is for like the training, validation, and fine tuning. This includes some of the recipes, UI, studio, safeguards, all of that, right, to train these models, to fine tune them, and to inference them. WatsonX.data, this is a very important piece. We all know that data is the most important component when you train your model. What we see in the industry today is pretty much like Wild West, where you're training data, I'm sorry, training models across data that you might not have uh, full control or full permission, right? And there are many issues with the models getting like uh, legal troubles because of the data. WatsonX.data is our um, approach to have a curated data set are not only like uh, the data set itself, but the tooling to do things like uh, filtering, hat removal, hate and abuse, speech removal, right? Uh, license identification, language identification, also in a way to bring enterprise data, right? So if you want to, want to bring your own data as well. So it's a curated uh, data sets to train our own models, but also to engage with clients. And what's on X.governance? Uh, these models are only good uh, uh, based on like the output they provide in the field, meaning that you have to be very careful with uh, things like drift uh, or even like uh, hate and abuse speech in the model output, right? Uh, or things like uh, a change in regulation for example, you have a, like a user, a given data set with a given license to train your model, but there was some change, you're not allowed to, to have that data set in the mix anymore. How you track these things, triggering like a retraining, replacement of the model, right? So dot governance is all about the safeguards around using these models in the field. So this is a solution for the enterprise, right? Uh, 
if you go to the next one, uh, just to position um, what's an X ac across what we just discussed, right? So at the bottom, we have OpenShift AI as the platform, as the building block. This is the open source integrated stack that you described. And then on top of it, we are adding this kind of value add, right? Things like, again, the models themselves that IBM is producing, um, uh, things like a studio, safeguards, um, uh, and so on, right? Um, so this is how you kind of look at the, across the stack. What I want to do now is to take you through some use cases and deployments, right? Um, we have a very, some very significant inter interesting validation for this uh, stack. So if you move to the next one, the first of all is actually deploying this at scale, right? Uh, we all know that uh, when it comes to training large models, you need very specialized infrastructure. So what I show here is that this uh, stack it's uh, pretty much portable, meaning that you can run this on commodity environment, but also on very specialized ones. So what I'm showing here is uh, the Vela supercomputer. So this is something that IBM put together using um, state-of-the-art uh, infrastructure, things like A100 GPUs with nodes, uh, with eight A100s per node, uh, uh, specialized networking, but we're doing the, all of this with a cloud control plane, meaning that we're virtualizing these nodes. Right? And we made some very interesting decisions here for like the network, for example. Everybody goes with InfiniBand for many reasons. We demonstrate that you can actually save a network. You can do Ethernet with some of the tricks uh, at the stack to do uh, better um, computation uh, and communication uh, uh, collocation right, and placement. And we show that you can actually scale this uh, to very large models. More important message here is that uh, with this uh, environment, we can do like the whole life cycle with one single stack. Users don't have to actually worry about the underlying infrastructure itself, right? All of this is kind of abstracted. You start with uh, your SDK. You say uh, you provide like uh, inputs for resource utilization and so on, and the stack takes care of actually placing this. Uh, what we have running on this uh, environment today, anything from like a single GPU job all the way to a job that takes like five to 600 GPUs uh, per single job, right? Um, this uh, environment supports preemption, right? Meaning that uh, you can have like a low priority jobs that can be preempted by like a, uh, some production runs that you need to kind of uh, take precedence, right? And all of this again on the same platform. So this is not aspirational. We are running actually this internally for production for our models, but we're also taking this to other environments. Uh, on this uh, slide, I show some of like the speeds and feeds, the benefits that you're getting with, uh, with this stack. On the left-hand side, with Ray, something that we're doing is really kind of unifying the pipeline across one single runtime, right? I talked about the fragmentation, how hard sometimes it is to combine different things, right? We had this internally at IBM as well, meaning that some of the teams would be using Spark or they're writing their own kind of ad hoc uh, Python code to scale. Bringing all together around the Ray API allowed us to run this as a pipeline, meaning that now any of my user can actually submit this without uh, specific knowledge about the implementation, right? It's more like a unified. Um, and all our steps to pre-process are mostly now running with Ray. What we saw in the field was that we went from like a days, mostly to coordinate across different runs, to something that now runs in minutes to hours, right? just because we're able to do like better coordination across, across these steps. Um, on the right-hand side, uh, as Tani mentioned, we have a very close collaboration with PyTorch community as well. If you haven't seen, we made some big announcements around this. Uh, one of them is around the API for training. Uh, we are one of the contributors to FSDP, Fully Sharded Data Parallel, um, distributed training approach, which is part of PyTorch, and you can run this on top of Ray as well. When you do this, you get uh, some very, very good uh, um, parallel efficiency. Uh, in fact, we're able to train models up to 11 billion parameters with up to 90% parallel efficiency, which is state of the art in the industry. Um, again, all of this is uh, absolutely abstracted in terms of like access to infrastructure, right? So if you bring your PyTorch FSDP code here, you can run on this platform without any change. We use Ray for orchestration of GPUs and uh, the schedule underneath, everything's kind of integrated and you don't have to worry, right? You don't need to write YAML files, you don't need to, to do all like the plumbing typically needed uh, to deal with this type of platforms. Um, uh, if you go to the next one, um, I think I convinced you like how we use this and why it's great. 
I want to show a little bit uh, some of like uh, the validation that you'll be doing with the community. There is one in particular that you're very proud about. You might have heard about this. We partnered with NASA um, to build uh, the very first geospatial foundation model. So this is basically showing that transformer technology is applicable beyond language. This is very exciting, right, to see the same type of uh, benefits and generality in foundation models going, again, beyond language. So what we did with NASA was to do, again, I mean, to do the whole life cycle, meaning that uh, these guys, they have uh, tons of geospatial data. When I say tons, uh, this is like a compared to language, it's like orders of magnitude, right? We're talking about petabytes of satellite data. Uh, we set about to actually train a model there, applying again transformer technology. Uh, we can talk about like uh, the actual architecture that you use and so on. For this talk, I'll kind of give you like the summary. Uh, we train a model and uh, uh, we then, this is using the IBM Velo supercomputer that I mentioned, right? Uh, the model was trained there. And uh, can you, I think, uh, can you play the, there is a video, yeah, if you, uh, in the video, like, uh, you see, like, uh, the, th the thing actually happening, right? So we can use exactly the type of uh, interface that you described. So what you see in the right-hand side is what the NASA data scientist sees, right? A Jupyter Notebook, an SDK where you can define resources. Then we train this model uh, on IBM Cloud. This takes, like, hundreds to thousands of GPUs, as you can imagine. And the beauty here is that once you train the model, now we can actually move the model and fine-tune it uh, on NASA's environment, and that's exactly what we did. So this stack is very much portable, meaning that we ran for training on one cloud, IBM Cloud, but for fine-tuning, we brought this stack on NASA's uh, managed uh, science environment, right, uh, that runs on AWS. Uh, there, the data scientist has the same experience. You start with the Jupyter Notebook, we can package the whole experience in terms of uh, some of like uh, the profiles to do fine-tuning. Uh, they can run this uh, without any kind of knowledge of how you actually deploy VMs on AWS or how you deal with actual Kubernetes and so on. Of course, you run this with OpenShift uh, on Rosa, right, with then. And um, we got very, very, very good feedback with this. We're able to enable very quickly a lot of scientists to start with this very general uh, just spatial foundation model and go, thing, and go to things like, uh, let me fine tune this for burn scars or flood mapping, right? Things that, like I was saying before, would take like a, its own pipeline together. So before they're doing like a single model to detect like burn scars, a satellite image, and then another model for anomaly, an, an anomalies for like a flooding and so on. With this foundation model, they can start with something very general, just fine tuned for that specific use case. It's much, much faster. So we're seeing like a lot of like new use case enabling. And given that, now that we have this very general foundation model and that we prove that you can do fine tuning, we release this model as well in Hugging Face. Uh, it was the very first uh, model uh, in geospatial uh, uh, science domain. Uh, there was a lot of traction in the community. You might have heard about this. Uh, it's available in Hank Face, as I said before. We have blogs around this. Uh, NASA has been talking about this. Not only NASA, we're very proud that to see like a lot of the other players in the industry now also using this model for its generality, right, and ease of use in terms of fine tuning. Um, if you go to the next one, uh, let me try to wrap up so we can save some time for questions. Uh, just a little bit on what is next for us, right? I showed you that there is a way to kind of abstract uh, these layers, right, in a way that becomes very simple for the user to basically get going with this tag. Uh, the next step is to create more like uh, uh, profiles or automation, end-to-end -end recipes, right? So you can actually get going even uh, more easily, right? So this is one of the things that you're doing, so like how you can package the whole fine-tuning of the geospatial model, for example. Uh, Cube Ray, uh, it's a big piece for us, meaning the integration of Ray with Kubernetes. So we have been very active in this community. Um, there is an integration that we've been working on, uh, MCAT, the job schedule in Cube Ray is in place, but we want to make this even better, right? Uh, there's a lot of tuning at the Kubernetes layer, right? I described something to you that uh, sounds great, but again, I mean, um, there was a lot of like, uh, uh, learning and expertise at like tuning Kubernetes for this. A lot of these things can be actually embedded as profile that can be delivered to this uh, open source stack. Uh, on the right hand side, uh, PyTorch, right? As I said, uh, there's a lot of room to continue improve in terms of the APIs for distributed training. FSDP is a big one for us. We want to go to something more like hybrid now, FSDP, but tensor parallel, right? Uh, on the KKit side, uh, this is for the fine tuning piece. Right, there is uh, a lot we can do, including pluggable uh, Python APIs for tuning inference. We continue to evolve uh, KKit. 
RAG is another one that's big for us. We're also bringing RAG to this platform. And finally, when you deal with GPUs, anybody in the industry doing anything uh, large scale with the GPUs, you know that they fail. This is not very reliable, right? It's a very complicated and finicky environment. So there's a lot of opportunity for us to make uh, uh, fault tolerance in Kubernetes better. And we're bringing some of these learnings uh, at that layer as well. So that's what is next for us. I hope uh, this resonated with you. Um, uh, we really kind of encourage you to try out everything that we described, but it's open source, right, around the Open Data Hub community. So we encourage you to uh, check the QR code, go see, uh, read our blogs, and uh, give it a try and, uh, and share feedback with us. And you're here to build together. Um, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. yeah. All right. Yeah. You mentioned the IBM Bell computer was very large. Was the NASA computer similar or smaller? Or yeah. Uh, very good question. So the NASA model was trained on Vela, right? Uh, because we're growing the systems, we typically don't say like the actual number of GPUs. So what you say typically public is like over thousands of GPUs, right? This is, I mean, the scale when we train. Uh, the geospatial model, right? Uh, it's growing this environment. Um, on the NASA side, right, they have an AWS account where they could actually grow to many GPUs, but these are like many fine tuning jobs, right? Meaning that it's more like throughput. Each job was like four to six GPUs, and then it had many users running at the same time. So it's like a one big job for training versus many smaller jobs, but many concurrent jobs, right? Uh, there is another side of this which is on-prem with NASA where they have like a much larger pool and I can also not comment on like the actual number, but it's also the same order of magnitude, right? We're talking about like thousands of GPUs running this stack. I hope this answered. Any other questions? Um, so I'm very curious about the, the, the use of um, this generative models for uh, geospatial tasks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, is it something you have liberty to discuss or do we need to talk to people at, at NASA just to get the intuition yeah. behind the tasks and, 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 right. and, and yeah, so here's the good news, right? So this is a, an area with NAS which is all about like open data, like open source, right? So they're very open about what we're doing. In fact, like they released the model itself. There's a lot of like literature around this. So we've been publishing papers, blogs, even some of the tooling. So what I'll do, I'll kind of connect with you, I'll give you some, some of these pointers and uh, there's a lot of information around this and the model itself, right? Of course, we have not only published the model, but also some of the recipes for you to get going and get started with the model as well. Yeah, so very good. Any more questions? Uh, I guess if that is, if there's no more questions, um, can we give a round of applause for Carlos right. and team? Thank you Thank so you. much for joining us on Summit.